Good afternoon, everybody. Behave yourself. Uh, so my name's Sam Gaunt. Uh, I'm head of media at Lidl here in the UK. Uh, I've been there for about five years. Prior to that, various agencies um, for about 15 years before that. I've worked with a number of different brands. In all cases, uh, the one area of commonality across all those brands is the power of TV in building those brands uh, and driving sales. When I think about the last five years with Lidl, um, it's been quite well publicized about how important uh, our TV-led Little Surprises brand campaign has been in changing brand perceptions. Possibly less well publicized is the layer of uh, product and price activity uh, that sits underneath that, um, a type of activity which we can loosely call activation, um, which is really about driving footfall into stores, driving um, sales in the short term. Uh, and that's really what our panel is here to discuss today, uh, about the power of TV in driving sales um, or indeed um, in an activation uh, capacity. I've got a fantastic panel with me today. Uh, you're not going to hear very much of me. I'm hoping to uh, curate a fantastic discussion today, uh, a job which should be made a bit easier because um, we've got a great lineup here. Uh, so first of all, we've got Sue, Sue McVie. Uh, she's a commercial and marketing leader. She's worked with various brands Coke, PepsiCo, Vodafone. Uh, for the last seven years, she's worked with Kerry Foods as a, a director of their uh, direct to consumer arm, um, in, including uh, the launch of a new uh, brand, Oak House Foods, where she's managing director. Um, so she's got very close interest, in, of course, in how all media can drive um, direct sales. Uh, then we have Joe, Joe Kinsella. She's executive vice president and chief revenue officer at TV Squared. Uh, the performance and analytics platform. Uh, Joe has 20 years of experience with various uh, software, uh, marketing technology, financial services technology. So, um, uh, and Ashore should be very happy to talk to us about uh, TV Square and about uh, TV analytics. Uh, next up, we have uh, Simon Valcarcel. Simon Valcarcel, sorry, Simon. <laughs> he's head of creative and media at O2. Prior to that, he was at Talk Talk, where he built the brand into a household name. Um, and TV has been a real key driver of that. Um, he's also an Oasis fan. Some might say one of the <laughs> biggest fans. Uh, pleased to see he's left the cigarettes and alcohol um, <laughs> half the world away today. Uh, and next to him, uh, we have finally we have John Waits. He's senior director uh, of global media partnerships at Dentsu Regis Network. Uh, John's responsible for Dentsu Regis' strategic relationships. Uh, with Google, Facebook, and Amazon, and so on, um, building on experience as managing partner, where he was responsible for media planning and buying, um, with, and he's built up you know, a, a, a many years of expertise in AV in all its forms. Uh, so that's our activation uh, panel today. Uh, I'm going to start off with a question uh, for you, actually, Simon. Um, so when we think about kind of TV as a, a brand or an activation medium. <coughs> Uh, do, is that something which, in your experience, is a, is a helpful way of thinking about it? Do you kind of think about bucketing TV activity into, into either brand or activation? Uh, I mean, at O2, we're very lucky that brand is one of our board KPIs, as well as a number of other um, things. But brand is really important for us as, as, a bit, as a business. So, and we know that TV can really drive the performance of our brand. But because we have very healthy marketing budgets, we've also used brand and TV to push um, our activation side of the business. So throughout my time at O2, we kind of use TV depending on, on the objectives. We know that for activation, it works incredibly well. Whenever we advertise actually pretty much anything, we see a spike in our organic search traffic, in our web traffic, social, app, whatever we're, we're kind, of, kind of trying to do. So much so that we work on a spot basis with our digital teams so that we know when the big spots are going to happen so they can forecast for, for demand. So, I mean, TV is such a big part of our business to drive both brand and activation that we don't really split it out. We split out our campaigns until they've got more slightly more brand objectives, more activation objectives. But TV is such a good driver for, for us as a business that we tend to just use it for the, for the medium as opposed to the mm. brand or activation. And do you have, I guess, in a way, you've got two hats, you've got a media hat, but you're also head of creative as well. So do you think when you're developing the creative assets that run on TV, um, do you, again, do you kind of think about those priority objectives as to whether this is designed, what kind of effect that it's designed to elicit? Um, and then, um, so you might have a slightly different asset for when it's d d delivering brand perception versus 
where you've got a, a specific, say, search objective? Yeah, we do. I mean, first off, you've got to make a good ad, because if you make a bad one, that could equally work, but generally they don't. So we've got to make a good ad. So regardless of the um, objectives, that is always at, at the forefront of, of our mind. Are people going to notice it? Are people going get, to get the message? And are people actually going to take an action off the back of it? Now, depending on the type of brief, we generally tend to change our call to action. At, at the end, we find that works particularly well. I mean, one thing that we're testing at the moment is there's always a debate between do you put search something or do you put a URL or do you put an, an app down, whatever it is on, on the end. But actually, we, we've found that if we simply put search O2 shop at, 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 at the end, the journey for customers is so much better because Google, you type that into Google and it shows you location, your nearest store, it takes you straight into the, um, the sales site, it gives you all this extra information that you just wouldn't get if you put search, whatever the name of your campaign is. So we're, we are testing, I'd say the, the, the biggest thing with us is we're testing call to actions and how the different ones can impact the customer journey because it has to, ultimately, you're trying to get somebody to do something, whether that's change perspectives, whether it's download an app, whether it's to, to go and look and find out more information. So we find call to actions are really important on TV. Mm. John, with Indensu Aegis, obviously you've got a, such a broad range of different clients from direct to consumer through to kind of what we might think of uh, kind of pure uh, brand players. Uh, do, you, do you think it's unhelpful to think about separate buckets of activation versus brand? Yeah, I do think it causes friction in the process potentially. I think if you think in the way that most agencies are set up, you tend to have a, a TV team or an AV team, you've then got a separate performance team, maybe a separate digital buying team. It's quite archaic in many ways, and you sort of end up infighting sometimes between budget, when really and truly, you know, that TV budget, that video budget is doing largely the same job and complementing the other, the other disciplines, uh, and we don't spend enough time thinking about all of the, how all those things work together. Um, once that brief has gone through the comms planning process, you're quite often divvied up and very, very separate. You end up, you end up with a, an AV team planning for reach-based metrics. You end up with a performance team trying to push the short-term <coughs> ROI metrics through digital. It's not f as fully connected as it should be, and that's the way that agencies are set up. Um, you do need specialism. Each of those things is very difficult to do and can take years to build up a specialism in. Um, but the way they're set up isn't necessarily uh, optimal right now, I think. Mm. And then, I guess, that's also a function of the way which clients are set up in many cases as well. You yeah, often kind of get yeah we still get a performance budget or a brand budget um, and asked to, to separate out in that way. So, yeah, it, it does start from the top and from the briefing process, and we're set up around that. I think until that whole process changes, we're going to be stuck in that, that loop for a time. Yes. So, as managing director of a, it's a, a small direct-to-consumer yeah. business, is that something which you've kind of noticed around that kind of siloed way of working which the industry seems to adopt. And I guess, in your case, that's almost quite alien for you, where, oh, where totally. you've got a relatively small We don't have the team. luxury of silos, there's just not enough of us. And, um, you know, and it was interesting, actually, we were talking to Simon be before we came on, and you know, he was talking about his, uh, his latest ad with Beyonce. I mean, I've got Rachel from Bristol. You know, it, we just work in a very, very different, different space. So I think the challenge with TV for a small, a small business is we're more in the performance place at the moment and you know I dream of getting to a space with a business where we can we can start to use TV for more of a brand building exercise but I think and it was a fascinating um, presentation this morning around how brands grow and it's it really resonated with me because you know the principles are all still the same but I think when you're in a when you're in a small business TV is almost seen as a little bit of a luxury mm. because it's, it's uh, by, by its sort of general nature, I think a small business's staff were generalists, not specialists. It's a very complicated industry to look at from the outside in. And the hurdle rates are perceived to be quite significant. We, um, we had a little dabble with TV last year um, to do a bit of test and learn. And we, we were down to the sort of the spot mechanics. Mm -hmm. And being in a D2C business, you know, we could have the screen there. And we, <laughs> watch our ad come up and ping goes the website and what have you. So we could see that we could see the immediacy of response. Um, and I suppose at our, the stage in our life cycle, we're looking for performance metrics at the moment. But it, it, for me, yeah, you have to make sure that your creative is faithful to your brand. So um, I think at, you know, we, we, as we grow, we will continue to use TV. But at this stage in our evolution, we're much more performance marketing led. Mm. 
And would you say TV is less effective as a performance marketing medium relative to search or uh, yeah. you know, display where you can be very targeted, it's got a low capital cost, or in many cases yeah. low cost per thousands, where you've got to TV, you've got, you, do you have that perception of TV actually is, is, is almost kind of the last level? Yeah, it was interesting actually, because we, um, we, 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 test, we test and learn a lot and we, we test quickly and we learn quickly. And when we tested our TV, what we found is that in its own right, it didn't really pay back. Um, however, the effect that it had on the other medium, so its, mm. its, its effect on digital, its <coughs> effect on search, um, was significant. So actually, for us, it plays a role in our media mix, but as it, in, in its own right, it, it, it isn't a channel that yeah, directly mm. pays back. That, yeah. But that's the beauty of D2C, because you can see all of that. that, and, that and that is a difficulty in the kind of evolved nature of attribution that we kind yeah. of find, find ourselves in. I think I talked to you guys about it before, but I used to plan <laughs> DRTV for a, a large uh, cruise brand. Uh, and, and one morning I get into work and they're saying, um, John, is the, the TV, is it TV running? I said, of course the TV's running. It doesn't happen in TV. Of course it's running. These guys know what they're doing. Um, pick up the phone to, to the broadcaster. Sure enough, problem with the copy hasn't been going out. I said, well, how did you know? And they said, well, the call center's not been ringing. The phones haven't been ringing. Of course it works. Like it works in the short term. We're now into a place where people aren't picking up the phone and calling. That's not the mechanic they're responding by. And they're going online. They're going shop O2. They're searching in different ways, you get into a whole mix and muddle then of, well, was that driven by the search? Was that driven by my social campaign? And I, unfortunately, I think in the current attribution models, TV gets a bit of a kicking through that because it's, it's driving it, but other things are picking up attribution in that space, and we haven't quite knuckled down exactly mm. the effect that's, that's, that's being pushed. So in a way, TV, because it drives such a broad range of effects, then actually that's almost a, a curse as much as a blessing yeah. because if you're only measuring one of those effects, it might not be washing its face as yeah, effectively. Absolutely. I mean, in, in, we, we don't see that. I mean, we've, in our kind of metrics, TV is, is constantly up there as um, the highest return on investment, yeah. um, al along with search, interestingly, so you can see how they, they work together. But um, it, it, it is a really important driver. And um, I mean, I don't profess to know how, they, how the magic of econometrics works. We have to get mm. our data people up don't here. But it, um, it, you know, it's, it's a good um, tool yeah. for us to kind of sell in to, well, I to guess increase our econometrics works at that, on that longer time scale, doesn't it? It tends to be, you know, I don't think, I'm not aware of any brand that will do it any more frequently than a quarterly or half yeah. yearly. So it's kind of almost like this last step of measurement to a certain extent yeah. that kind of tells you, looking backwards, this is how your, uh, your campaign performance this is how TV yeah. drove sales. Um, but it's also quite a blunt tool as well, isn't it? You can't really get that level of granularity. I mean, yeah, Joe, I, I guess that's really yeah. where your your platform I've, comes I've, in with TV squared. It's a lot more kind of focus in the granular attribution. Or? I was going to say I've been very quiet. <laughs> so um, I think your cruise company, John, is is actually a client. So um, that's cool. Um, They're not one of my clients anymore, by the way. It wasn't because <laughs> I messed up their TV. <laughs> I think so. Just picking up on all the points that we've touched on and, and you know, I think what Sue said and definitely um, what Simon said, the activation plus brand piece needs to be considered as, as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the holy grail certainly that TV Squared is working with so many advertisers and the advertiser is king, the advertiser has the money, right? Um, is cross-platform, multi-touch, full funnel attribution. So whether it's a brand spot or whether it's an activation spot, you should be able to prove performance across the piece. I think, to Sue's point, we have um, a ton of direct-to-consumer brands that are on the platform right now that are digital natives. They have come from a world of social media. They've also come from a world of seeing data and analytics served up in an attribution platform on a minutely basis. And while you know, TV is a medium that cannot typically be optimized that frequently, the expectation is still that they want to see proof of performance every day. So we're looking at nightly as-run logs, nightly post logs, so that we can process that and put it in the platform for the next day so they can see on a spot-by-spot -spot basis how TV is performing. And I think, to Sue's point, you know, TV, um, there's no better marketing channel for driving reach and breadth of awareness. I mean, certainly your KPIs, the econometric stuff, 
Um, but also what we see is we do see a massive spike after so many spots aired because we now live in a world where everybody's sitting on the couch with um, a second screen, you know, uh, people are home with the kids, they're watching certain ads. We never dreamt that animation would be amazing for automotive, but it works. So it's about really being able to measure everything and having an analytics platform that we put into the hands of whether it's the agency, whether it's the advertiser themselves, to be able to say, you know what, I'm getting a positive return on investment from my TV spend. Yeah. And then that comes back to what we were talking earlier about Simon in terms of, in a way, you think about as a TV asset drives a whole range of responses that you don't actually yeah. bucket it into any one specific yeah, and, objective. And also, it's interesting what we were talking about um, earlier. It, it's amazing how many um, brands seemingly don't look at their whole ad and go, what could somebody potentially search for? So, um, yeah, we always make sure that we've got Shazam set up in case somebody likes, likes the track, any kind of key moments, um, whether it's the... Um, you know, the person that appears in it. I mean, um, Joe, the, the example you used at Budweiser, was it? Yeah. About the Super Bowl. Oh, the Super Bowl, that was it. Yep, Dame Judi Dench uh, in the Super Bowl two years ago, Budweiser. Mm. She said, don't be a pillock, don't drink and drive. And we probably saw the biggest spike in mm. search activity because none of the Americans knew what the word pillock meant. <laughs> um, so they all went online and searched pillock. Was there some paid search around but, the word pillock? Bud had not <laughs> bought no. the search term pillock. So again, it's that joined up media strategy yeah. that ties all the pieces together that I think you know, sometimes brands fall short of. Yeah, and, and it's almost that you need to use your whole creative as the activation really that's why it's quite useful to show it to people that haven't been involved in the process because you almost can't see the woods for the trees yeah. sometimes to say well if you're watching this this clean what kind of things do you pick up is it that it was that track that was it was a lyric that we could yeah. uh, buy a search around because you might you know you never know what might blow up but actually to buy a keyword for something that is then not going to get any clicks on it, it's not going to cost you anything really but it could be and outside of, of the UK, I mean, I'm actually based in the, in the States, we have, um, we have several advertisers that use our platform to <coughs> A-B test their creative. So we have brands that do 40 creatives a year, so I don't know how many you do, but 40 creatives a year, and obviously respecting the size and scale of the United States, what works on the West Coast in LA and San Francisco might drive a really poor reaction on the East Coast. Mm. So again, having an analytics platform that can show you that, so you can understand how to switch in and out creative to keep your activations level, but also not do a peloton and wipe a billion dollars off your share price with one ad. Um, you know, those are the things that you want to be able to measure. Mm. Um, John, obviously a huge range of clients that you'll, you work with within uh, Tensu Aegis. Um, do, you ever, uh, do you ever have a client suggesting, I, I want a TV campaign to do X, Y, Z, and you find yourself recommending against it because um, for, for whatever reason, maybe they're looking to, to, to they're, they could be barking up the wrong tree. Uh, maybe not specific to telly, but I think, yeah, we certainly have clients that have maybe their own idea of a strategy that we, we would have to challenge. That's our, our job as agent, I suppose, is to be putting forward the best strategy. I think it does happen quite a lot when you have a, a, a sort of a relatively new brand or D2C brands or any new entrants where I think their ambition is to, is to be on TV, but they're just not set up in the right way to do it. I think mm. someone talked about it earlier, the, the cost to barriers to entry of getting on TV. Mm. I think maybe they think as VOD and addressable TV as sort of cheap ways to start doing that, but that's really not what's going to help them build a, right. build a brand early on. And we may, may or may not talk about it, but actually pretty expensive way of doing it to, to go super targeted and not the way that, that most brands have built. And a lot of these brands are brands that have built their business through uh, self-service platforms on Google, on Facebook, uh, have have capitalised on the on the search volumes early on and, and built a built a business, but they now need to start building a brand and, and building a, um, some growth, some headroom, and that's where we need to start help, helping them into that more sort of you know to that TV space and to do that. Mm. To be perfectly honest, agencies aren't really set up brilliantly to do that. You know, we're not set up brilliantly to to, to manage small spending clients or to offer very flexible solutions. You know, in in the UK, for example, we're still dealing with two-month AB, AB deadlines to, to get booking onto TV. The brands we're talking to want to get up and running on TV and understand what the return they're getting is really quickly. We're not really set up in that way and not, not even in that kind of new addressable space yet. Um, so I think a lot of the time we end up 
edging caution, saying if you're going to do it, do it properly, and let's think of a plan to get there. Um, but ultimately, we do want we want to move brands into that space, and that's how they grow. So. Mm. And if if econometric modelling is almost the gold standard of working out how effective a TV campaign is, and yet your clients are wanting very short-term solutions in order to get a read. Do you find sometimes that those short-term uh, measurements are at odds with what that long-term econometric view is? Yeah, particularly if we're being paid by results. Yeah, that, that yeah. makes a big difference. Uh, yeah, because I think as I mentioned earlier, it can take months, even, even a year, to demonstrate ROI through econometrics on, on a platform, or even longer, depending on what they're trying to achieve. Um, I think that is the, the curse of, of brand CFOs and procurement teams. You, know, you have to show a return very quickly through your marketing spend, particularly for a, a growing or small brand where there's high pressure. Or someone said weekly, monthly, yearly sales targets. You've got to demonstrate that very quickly. And if we have to do that, we're challenged to do that as an agency, you probably will push them down the road of something that we can relatively easily demonstrate that return through uh, rather than something that's going to take a much longer period. And I think it, it depends on the maturity of the brand, right, John? Mm. I yeah, mean, massively, yeah. you're not going to recommend an econometric model to a direct-to-consumer brand. I was just about to say, no. I mean... Because it's know, too expensive. You couldn't and it, wait three months for it. <laughs> and it takes, it takes a long time. I think yeah. people want to see what's my short-term lift, what's my longer-term ab stock, and then what's my what's the total value of TV? You know, what's my return on investment? And certainly we talked a little bit in the green room about, you know, there's a whole lot of craziness in the US about OTT. Um, there's a lot of talk here about addressability. You know, it's about how do we go beyond uh, traditional reach and demographics to really give the advertiser what they need to be successful. At the end of the day, my direct to consumer advertisers like Intuit or uh, Untuck It or those types of brands, they want to see more sales. Their mm. objective is let's grow the business to Sue's point so we could mm. even have the luxury the privilege of, of, doing of, brand, yeah, exactly. of doing a brand spot. Well, yeah. And I'm not actually saying that the, the right approach is to tell brands to start small and build their brand from the bottom funnel because it can clearly work. Like To be slightly challenging, we had Sab up here earlier talking about Arcadia Group and the 80-20 digital split, and he talked about two brands that came to the market, Boohoo.com and ASOS, um, relatively quickly, and eight massive market share out of Arcadia Group. Now, what did they do? They spent very heavily on TV when they first launched. You yeah. couldn't move for Boohoo.com ads. Yeah. I'm not saying the marketing strategy wasn't right for Arcadia Group at the time, but they had two brands that took a gamble and went, we're going to go big on telly and build brands very quickly. Um, and that's paid off for them. Yeah, yeah. I think it does depend on the... Um, on the type of business, though, because I think for, for you know from a small business perspective, you're quite right. It's really difficult to get going in this space, and a lot of D2Cs are privately backed. Yeah, you know, so um, they've got investors that are wanting a really smart and quick return mm -hmm. on their investment, and they're actually not too interested in the the size of the prize five years down the track. They're more interested in right. I'm going to give you X million quid now, and I need what's my ROI exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I do think it's, um, I think you made a great point, Jonathan, around, you know, how would you get more, more, more sort of smaller businesses into this space? And I, I think it's very difficult at the moment with agencies. They're not really set up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to talk to you about a three-year relationship and a, you know, X zeros of spend, and you just say no thanks. Yeah. So I think if there's, what the, the real opportunity I see for agencies in the market is a, is a, is a, a really quick test and learn model to proof of concept. Mm -hmm. And once you prove the concept, then, then you can grow grow from there, but it's, yeah. it is difficult to get yeah, We need to add much more like very dip in, dip out services business to those brands. So if you want to build some creative quickly through yeah. the use of your assets or, yeah. or get on TV through a self-service <laughs> platform, we should be helping facilitate those things. Um, you know, that takes a lot of investment and time and people, but uh, I think yeah. the agencies that want to survive in that space are going to have and, to move. And I think that's why the, um, the online video um, space has grown so quickly, because it's very low barrier to entry. It's yeah. self-serve. Exactly. You can kind of put whatever creative you want on there, yeah. as long as it resonates with, you, with your audience. Mm -hmm. And you see results straight away. And so those brands that have grown through online video, they probably think, well, I've gone from here to here. And I can't think of examples off the top of my head. Maybe you've got some. But they're the ones that just go, well, why do we then need TV? Because mm -hmm. we've built our brand and our business using digital only channels. Like Dollar Shave Club, for yeah, example. Yeah, sure. You know, that's always the, the example that they use. I knew I did have one. Um, and 
yeah, so I, I think that, that's a challenge for, for small businesses. It's quite amusing is a lot of those brands are now moving into very, very traditional. So yeah. what Harry's Razors are now in Sainsbury's yeah. and yeah. You know, they're, so they're moving to a different standard I think of distribution. But I think that's because eventually you get to a point where you need scale. scale. Yeah. So you can, you, can, you can get your business model, and I've looked at lots of D2Cs, you can get your business model to a certain level. Yeah. And then if you really want exponential growth, you've yeah. got to go mass. Yeah. And clearly TV has a really big role to play in that. But it's how you can how you can proof of concept early doors, I think, mm. to build confidence in TV as a channel. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. it's what's funny is what's old is new again. So DR TV has suddenly become the new sexy thing to these brands, where it used to be the sort of slightly scruffy guy in the agency in the guy. corner. Like now that's the really interesting thing about telly. You can now start to prove some of that quick return yeah. in a way that you couldn't maybe five, ten years and ago. And I think that that you know, that traceability piece that you can you know, I I now find having spent many years on, on big brands and doing TV and what have you. I now, I'm make, making the kind of ads you watch when you're ill at home during the daytime. <laughs> and, um, but what you can do is make them super trackable. And what I love is the immediacy yeah. that I know I can, I can have a crack at something, test it, and I can see very quickly whether it looks like it's going to succeed or not. And you, get your, you can get into the joys of direct to consumer. You can get into your predictive analytics space so that you know if you've got from here to here by day one, you know you're going to be there by day yeah. 30. So it gives you confidence in the channel to invest. Um, but it's how you get going is the big, big challenge. I think back to your point, Simon. I mean, we've had brands originally, same as Sue said, venture-backed that come to us and say, we're going to start really small. Mm -hmm. We just want to do digital video. Can you measure it? Yep, OK, fine, let's go. Full, impression-based. But because then they realize that they want scale, mm -hmm. um, we've actually seen brands on our platform start spending, and this is real-life example, a million dollars in 2017, this year spending 40 million. Because to your point, John, they've kind of gone, OK, well, digital video worked so well, but now I want true scale. So mm -hmm. now I'm going to yeah. go to traditional linear. Yeah. And actually, TV Squared <coughs> offers a single unified platform for linear and digital. So it's great because mm -hmm. they can see what's not working on linear and they can move that budget to test and learn in digital and vice versa. And I think as we go into 2020, the new decade, it's going to be about that mix and how, as agencies and advertisers alike and analytics platforms alike, how do we serve up insights that play to the mix and therefore allow our advertisers to optimize across the whole of TV? TV being, for me, content and distribution, not linear, digital, digital video, you know, kind of all of it. And Certainly, D2Cs want all of it, and they want it all optimised, and they want it all want performance, it and they want it now. <laughs> yeah, they want it now, too. Yeah. And when you're optimising across there, I mean, I like that point around AV being, it's a broad church, isn't it? There's lots mm. of different channels, AV channels within AV. Like, when you're kind of optimising across those different uh, channels, do you find that there are certain channels which work, seem to work much, that much harder? And my own perception would be, Linear TV must be quite a, a pleasant surprise for a lot of these brands who've just been focusing digital video and used to paying 40, 50 pounds view for CPM, suddenly finding themselves looking at six or seven um, against a board of linear TV. It must be working incredibly effectively for them, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it highlights that there are areas, whether it be a particular day part, a particular day of week, that drives an astronomical level of uh, of performance that they were not expecting. Um, we see things like kids programming outperform over and over again, you know, animation for automotive, because again, you're sitting there on the couch. Yeah. Untuck It, one of our biggest favorite clients who have seen astronomical growth in the D2C space, just opened two stores actually in London. Um, one of my favorite meetings was their agency guy was, you should just buy more golf because all blokes that want a, a shirt that's untucked watch golf. Um, I was like, why don't we wait and see what the data tells us? Um, and actually, because golf is, you know, it's quite expensive. So what did we see? We actually found that female programming was driving their highest sales. Mm -hmm. So wives, girlfriends, kids were actually going online, buying the shirt. Yeah. So they've been able to then take those learnings, 
heavy up in female programming. They've seen their sales go through the roof. They're now testing and learning on OTT, and they're actually seeing three to five X in terms of um, response against their CPMs. So mm. it's a good story. That's what I love about data is that ability or the potential for you to actually uncover really real insights, yeah. which sometimes are counterintuitive. Um, Simon, have you ever kind of uncovered something surprising from the data which wasn't what you were expecting? Um, I mean, unsurprisingly, as a, as a, as a telco, we, we hold a, a huge amount of data to provide the service to, to our customers. Um, and pretty much, unfortunately, everything that you do on your phone, somebody knows about, whether it's Google, whether it's um, your provider, whether it's, you know, whatever, everyone knows everything about you. But at um, O2, we, we've, the data we have on our, on our customers, one of the things that we, that, that we use is web logs and uh, the apps that are on people's phone. Because obviously going over the network, you can see it on bbc.co.uk or The Guardian or Sky Sports or Mumsnet or whatever those kind of, um, before it gets to slash sports, slash whatever is. And so we're, we're now part of our briefing into the agency saying, well, previously you would have used TGI to tell us what this particular audience group, their media behaviors may have been. Mm -hmm. We are now much more putting into our briefs to say these three media owners are, um, are really popular with our customer groups. Right. So therefore, we expect to see proposals against these three, but also there could be an extra few that, that, you, that you may think. But it's using that data to more inform how we get you know, an outcome from our, from our agencies, mm. particularly on um, like web blogs, for example. John, is too much data a dangerous thing for marketers? I think it can be if you can get bogged down in it. I think you can start to lose sight of the, you know, of, we talked about brand earlier, or building brands. I think the challenge that if I was a CMO sitting in a brand and I have a CFO that wants to see return very quickly, it takes a brave CMO to be like, I'm going to invest heavily in a really nice, sexy piece of creative that I think is going to drive positive sentiment about this brand and build it over the next five years. That's really difficult to do, and I understand that in the, the current climate. It, I think you can get bogged down in too much data and get too obsessed with it. We've seen endless case studies, econometric models showing that uh, brands can succeed through creating fantastic creative and putting nice bits of ours uh, in the right environments. And ultimately, one of the big strengths of TV is that everyone has the same shared experience. Like everyone sees the same ad, people get talking about it, it drives social conversation. That's what, that's what, that's what great advertising looks like. And it's not to say that it isn't, isn't a role for targeted advertising and for using data, but if you forget the other part, you can get driven down a, a route where everyone's going to see something different and you get into either a very dangerous place or an impossible to, to activate against kind of place. You know, we talked about the role of of targeting, for example, and I'll use an example from watching telly last night. I was watching a, a, a TV program on a, on a, on a, I can't say any names, so on a, on a, on a video on demand app on my TV, and a, a supermarket had done a personalized ad to my, to my TV set, telling me where my nearest superstore was. Now I live in Kent, apparently my nearest store was in Bearstead, 21 miles away. There are 17 other stores closer to me, one is one mile down the road. So someone's got bogged down in data, thought it'd be great to tell this guy where his nearest store is. It doesn't work, <laughs> like, he's nowhere near me, and I think that just gives you a more negative perception of the brand. I would have rather have seen that brand's Christmas ad and had a nice story about what their, what their pricing model was, for example, for turkeys this Christmas. But you know, I think sometimes you can get too bogged down, and when that's far removed from the technology and the capability, it can actually be a bad thing. Um, and I don't think the capability is quite there yet. I might uh, just add to that point, actually, Lidl's turkeys this Christmas. It wasn't Lidl. Outstanding quality. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for mine, thank you. <laughs> and a, a Sam, super you need to get out Turkey plug. Uh, <laughs> so, t talking about data, obviously, you've kind of, you're building a yep. direct to consumer brand from the ground up. How do you go about kind of prioritizing data and, and, and setting? Uh, start your... consumer back. Yeah. So the first thing we did was be really clear about our consumer journey and build our data around that. And uh, it's interesting, I think you make a great point around, you know, is in response to your question around, is there too much data? Actually, the skills that I think, you know, I've, I've, I don't know how many agency presentations I've sat through over the years where I've been blinded by data and mm. the two skills that are missing are insight development so lovely, but so what? And more importantly, do what? And then secondly, storytelling. So we, I have an in-house um, data scientist that, who's phenomenal, with number, I mean, much cleverer than I am. Um, and, and he can churn out the data, but the skill that you still need is that ability to say, okay, I see the data, but so what and do mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that's, a, I think, a core skill. What, what if, it doesn't matter how much data you have unless you have the ability to distill it into insight. So, so for us, we, we started with our consumer, we started with our consumer journey, um, we started with our spend, 
So, you know, every, every cent counts in, in our business, as it should in every business, but I think when it's a smaller, you know, the, the journey from the top of the P&L to the bottom is quite narrow. Yeah. So you really start to examine every single cent. Um, that, that return on investment for every single spend that we make is really, really important to us. And actually for my, you know, my backers, okay, I'm part of a PLC, we have shareholders and what have you, they all still want a return. So you've still got to be able to show, um, even though we run ourselves as a separate, separate business, you've still got to be able to account for your investment. Um, so figuring out what you get from those channels is, is super, super mm -hmm. important. Joe, linear TV is in decline. Um, it, we're, is it? We're losing, well, it depends, <laughs> <laughs> of course. There's a, that's a whole, that's a whole other panel discussion, I think. <laughs> if we were to assume for a moment that linear TV doing is in decline. Beautifully um, done, my friend. <laughs> is, that, is that, in a way, can that be good news for advertisers is it, if it's pushing people towards um, more kind of addressable formats? The growth in addressable TV is, is growing, um, which, is, which is great news for kind of um, data activation and attribution um, uh, methodologies as well. Mm -hmm. um, is the industry kind of evolving away from this very blunt broadcast, low cost, high reach model into something which is a bit more highly targeted, uh, more and uh, more measurable and ultimately more effective? If it Absolutely. Works. <laughs> if it works. <laughs> if it works. John has been scarred by his Tesco <laughs> ad experience. I didn't say that. <laughs> I think, um, you know, we've, we come at this um, in, a, in a data and analytics way, but without, you know, to Sue's point, which is really important, every single data point tells a story. Um, and what we try and do is inform our advertisers to be able to make change. Because you can have all this data and have all this analytics, but if it's not actually informing anything or educating people, then you, you know you kind of ask yourself, is it is it worth it? In terms of TV evolution, I think we've seen more change in TV in the last five years than we have in the last 50. I think absolutely when I think about TV now, especially you know in the US and we're in 76 countries so Japan you know th there's it's all about content and distribution and we should look at it as that rather than as you say you know rather than like just a flat kind of linear broadcast we can actually prove that more people are watching content than ever before so while super traditional linear might be declining it's still a 200 billion dollar industry ott is 5 billion going into next year addressable you know depends what uh, e marketer report we're looking at but again i think it's about emerging technology as advertisers you should all expect multi-touch, cross-platform, full funnel measurement. Because why would you buy a car if you don't know that the engine's actually gonna drive? Mm -hmm. So you want performance as part of that. We need, with GDPR and the California Privacy Act, we need data privacy, data security, we need all those things baked in. So I think there's gonna, we're gonna see standardization across the industry. But I think in terms of analytics and attribution, you know, as everyone's talked about, it is an evolution for TV. It is going to see the D2C brands are driving this next generation. As we enter a new decade, it's about how do we tie um, TV performance and return on investment back to the business outcomes that these guys are trying to reach. That's the key, regardless of how we consume it whether it's linear, whether it's OTT, whether it's digital video, mm -hmm. let's make sure that we can measure it and offer proof of performance so that these guys can grow their businesses. Great. We've just got a couple more minutes. Um, I'm going to finish with a quick fire round, mm -hmm. or to put it another way, just one <laughs> sentence from each of you. If you think about the next five years, what, and we're lucky enough to be invited back onto this stage. Uh, what, are the, what, are the, what are the, what's the key theme really that we'll be discussing? I'm gonna start with you, John. Because uh. you're looking very pensive there. It looks like the cogs are whirring and you've got an answer. The last five years are anything to go by. We'll be talking about exactly the same stuff we've been talking about today, I would imagine. <laughs> um, I, 
I, th I hope we would have started to see some different use cases for data in that TV space. So it's not one, sorry, it's not one sentence, but effectively I think we're only a tiny proportion of the way into the use cases for addressability and personalization in TV. It's been used at the moment to start you know, low cost entry to, to, for brands to target specific customers. Mm -hmm. I think there's a whole unexplored area of how you can, you know, big portfolio brands who have 20 brands under their belt can optimize their 20 million investment using addressability. So copy swap by household for specific audiences. I think we're only kind of at the, the cusp of what we can do with addressability and we, we need to have some, some bigger conversations around that. And hopefully we'll be sitting in five years time talking about how we've all optimized telly through better use of, of data in that respect. I will go quick. Fragmentation of content and platforms. Okay. Platforms and uh, just say yes. I know it's hard, but let's just get on with it. That's the true American spirit. You <laughs> tell you, fresh off the plane from New York. Jo. 12 Soon. years. Real Soon. time, real time data analytics. Remember, it not forgetting the bad old days when we had to wait three months for econometrics to yeah, measure TV. Let's not do that. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Um, and please join me in thanking the panel today.